Hey guys, welcome back to the next topic. In this one, we are going to cover Heme Onc in its entirety. And then in this lecture specifically, we're going to dive into microcytic anemia. So let's get started. So here are some of the most common causes of microcytic anemia. These are all a review from your step one exam. So don't forget things like iron deficiency, chronic inflammation that's often referred to as anemia of chronic disease, thalassemia, which has a lot of different forms depending on the hemoglobin subunit gene that are, is affected or which are affected. Keep in mind that they like to test to a pretty high level of detail on some of these different kinds of thalassemias, especially on the CK and the step one. So there's another lecture that's entirely dedicated to uh, specifically thalassemias, okay? So we're not going to dive into it too much here, but we will in a later lecture. Now, finally, in the United States, the less common causes of microcytic anemia, but a couple that could still pop up on exam day include sideroblastic anemia as well as lead poisoning. So let's start first with a very common cause of microcytic anemia, which is iron deficiency anemia. Now, the three main ways that iron deficiency can rise includes not consuming enough iron, not absorbing iron efficiently or sufficiently, or losing too much blood. Now, diets that are low in iron from, for example, not eating uh, foods that are rich in iron, so meats, uh, leafy green vegetables, or in infants who are exclusively fed uh, cow's milk and not breast milk or iron-fortified formula, these can all be reasons why iron deficiency anemia develops. Now, blood loss can also cause iron deficiency anemia, but it needs to be significant. But some of the possible scenarios that you want to keep an eye out for uh, include uh, heavy menstrual bleeding, GI bleeding, or colorectal cancers. And finally, certain malabsorptive states can cause iron deficiency anemia as well. Think infections, think H. pylori, think celiac disease. Okay. Now, the most common symptom that you will see that should really tip you off to iron deficiency anemia is going to be fatigue. Now, some patients will report pica, which of course is that appetite for certain items that are non-food items. So like ice, dirt, especially uh, very odd things, anything that's not real food. Um, patients may all also report uh, that they have sort of an exercise intolerance or that they're experiencing dyspnea on exertion, uh, as well as just generalized weakness or lethargy. And these are all things that you need to really have that light bulb go off when you see these and think, think okay, so uh, someone's extremely fatigued. Anemia needs to be at the probably top three of my list because it's simple to rule out and it's simple to treat. So either way, it's something that, and, and it's common. So either way, it's something you really need to uh, think about. Another condition uh, that you want to look out for is something known as atrophic glossitis. This is when you have a loss of papilla on the surface of the tongue, and it leads to the formation of this sort of this smooth, glossy appearance of the tongue. That's also something you might see as, as a uh, consequence of iron deficiency anemia. The labs that are consistent with iron deficiency anemia include a CBC showing low, low RBC counts, decreased hemoglobin, and decreased hematocrit. And as with all microcytic anemias, the mean corpuscular volume is low. There's also a, mean, a low mean uh, corpuscular hemoglobin and a low absolute reticulocyte count that you want to look out for. Now, iron studies that are consistent with iron deficiency anemia include low serum iron, increased serum transferrin, increased TIBC, and low ferritin. These iron studies should be fairly intuitive. If there is a low serum iron, that means you are deficient. There's a high transferrin level because transferrin is responsible for transporting iron to various tissues of the body. Now, the TIBC is high because with a deficiency of iron, there's a lot more iron binding capacity. And ferritin, which is an iron storage protein, is low because there are low iron stores in this type of anemia. Now, a diagnosis of iron deficiency anemia is made when any of the following criteria are met. Number one, a patient with known anemia, which resolves with iron supplementation. Number two, serum, tr serum ferritin is below 30 nanograms per milliliter. Uh, number three, transferrin saturation, which is calculated by dividing serum iron by TIBC and multiplying by 100 to get the percentage. If that percentage is less than 19, this indicates iron deficiency anemia. And finally, the gold standard is technically an absence of stainable iron in the bone marrow biopsy, but iron deficiency anemia is absolutely not an indication to get a bone marrow biopsy. That's just something you want to keep in mind. Please, for the love of God, if they say 
if you if they give you a scenario where we have an iron deficiency anemia patient, do not choose a bone marrow biopsy. You will get it wrong. Okay, unless everything else has been done, and that's the last resort. All right, I'm sure you guys wouldn't have <laughs> chosen that, but I got to say it regardless. Now, when it comes to treating iron deficiency anemia. It's going to include red blood cell transfusions. If we're dealing with a severe or a life-threatening anemia, that's typically not going to be what you're presented with, but something to keep in mind. Now, oral or IV iron supplementation can be used in mild to moderate cases. We'll typically go with the oral if it's just a mild case. Um, IV is going to be the route of choice for patients with surgery planned in the next two months. And those with IBD or with dialysis-dependent uh, kidney disease, or if the patient's not responding to oral alone, would all be indications for using IV. All right, let's move on with anemia of chronic disease. Now, this is a process by which pathological disease processes, most commonly inflammatory diseases and malignancies, will cause an increase of cytokines that results in the production of hepcidin by the liver. Now, hepcidin then acts to cause the degradation of ferroportin, which decreases absorption of iron from the gut, as well as the sequestration of iron in macrophages. Inflammatory cytokines also tend to decrease the average lifespan of a red blood cell. So inflammatory diseases that you absolutely want to keep an eye out for on the CK that can cause anemia of chronic disease include things like rheumatoid arthritis, SLE, inflammatory bowel diseases. Uh, keep in mind, though, that any inflammatory disease really can be a cause here. As well, any condition that is chronic and causes an inflammatory response can lead to anemia of chronic disease. All right, now let's take a look at the labs here. Now, there isn't any one lab value that will be used to make the diagnosis of anemia of chronic disease. Unlike an iron deficiency anemia where any one of those criteria that we went over were sufficient to make a diagnosis, anemia of chronic disease is a diagnosis of exclusion. And the following labs all point towards the diagnosis. So first, the uh, mean corpuscular volume, the MCV, can be microcytic or normocytic, and there will be a low reticulocyte count. In terms of iron studies, there will be low serum iron and low TIBC. However, serum ferritin will be normal or increased. In anemia of chronic disease, iron is sequestered within macrophages, and ferritin, being an iron storage protein, is typically elevated. It is also possibly going to be normal, but it should not be low like an iron deficiency anemia. Low transferrin saturation is also present, and remember that this is calculated by dividing serum iron by TIBC. Now, elevated ESR and CRP can also be seen depending on the inflammatory cause of anemia of chronic disease, but if they do give you ESR or CRP and they're elevated, obviously this means it's some sort of inflammatory process going on, and you should sort of move this one higher up on your most likely ladder and maybe put other things like iron deficiency a little bit lower because obviously that's not associated so much with an inflammatory state. Now, when it comes to treatment, it's going to consist mainly of treating your underlying inflammatory disorder. If the patient experiences severe and life-threatening anemia, they can be treated with red blood cell transfusion. Iron supplements are only given to those with both iron deficiency anemia and anemia of chronic disease. You don't want to give iron to patients who only have anemia of chronic disease because remember that while serum iron is low, there's usually a good amount of iron locked up in storage in the macrophages. Now, it might help you to remember that the proposed reason why anemia of chronic disease is seen is because evolutionarily, iron is needed by bacteria in order to replicate and cause severe infection. And so cytokines are thought to act to sort of sequester iron in storage form rather than in the serum where bacteria could actually use it. And because these cytokines are also seen in inflammatory diseases, we can have this anemia of chronic disease. All right, let's move on now to some more rare causes of microcytic anemia, starting with sideroblastic anemia. So this anemia is named for the ring sideroblasts that are seen on stained bone marrow biopsy smear. These ring sideroblasts are red blood cells that are developing in the bone marrow, but that have pathologic iron deposits in the mitochondria that surround the nucleus of the cell, hence that ring-like appearance on staining. These sideroblasts form due to dysfunction in proteins involved in heme synthesis or mitochondrial function. Causes of sideroblastic anemia include things like non-reversible causes, so think congenital mutations. Uh, mutations caused later in life by myelodysplastic syndromes, myeloproliferative neoplasms, or reversible causes like alcohol use or abuse, hypothermia, certain medications um, like isoniazid or linozolid, and even copper deficiency. So symptoms include those same symptoms of anemia that we've gone over, including fatigue, generalized weakness, pallor, dyspnea on exertion, 
plus there can be hepatomegaly as a result of buildup of iron in the liver. Now the labs here are going to depend on the underlying cause of the sideroblastic anemia, but typically sideroblastic anemia is microcytic in most congenital causes. The peripheral blood smear may show RBC morphology abnormalities, such as satyrocytes, and if these satyrocytes are present, this is pathognomonic for the disease. So, if you see a lab or a, a histo slide that, that shows you uh, satyrocytes, if they tell you that they see them or they describe them, that's pathognomonic, you've got your diagnosis. Now, when it comes to the rest of the labs here, patients will have a low to normal reticulocyte count, increased serum transferrin saturation, an increase in serum ferritin, and an increase in serum iron. Low serum copper and serial plasmin levels can be seen if copper deficiency is the cause for which patients can be identified with genetic testing in congenital causes. Now, the diagnosis of the sideroblastic anemia is made, like I said, when we see ring sideroblasts on the bone marrow biopsy. Treatment includes blood transfusions if patients are symptomatic. Uh, close monitoring, though, for iron overload must be done. And as I mentioned, hepatomegaly can result because iron can build up. Okay, especially if the patient is getting frequent transfusions. Now, this excess iron can be treated with iron chelators like deferoxamine or deferasorox. Some patients might also be good candidates for the drug Luspatercept. This is an erythroid maturation drug, which encourages late-stage erythropoiesis. Now, let's take a look at lead poisoning. Uh, so, lead exposure in adults can be occupational, especially someone who is a metal worker, uh, has a career in metalworking. So, think battery production, lead mining, smelting, things like that. Uh, those jobs are less common these days, but you still need to look out for them. Now, it can also be encountered in contaminated drinking water if lead-soldered pipes are used. So, um, you know, that's probably not something you're going to see a lot of. Uh, another thing you need to be aware of, but you won't see a lot of, it would be paint um, from the 70s or earlier. So, you're not going to see a brand new house that ha causes uh, lead poisoning. But if someone moved into an older house, let's say, that was built before the 70s and hasn't been changed... It could be lead-based paint. Now, acute lead poisoning can manifest in a variety of different ways. You might see anemia, fatigue, irregular sleep, headache, concentration difficulties, depression, abdominal pain, constipation, arthralgias, and myalgias. So hopefully you remember from your step one that lead inhibits enzymes that are used in hemoglobin synthesis, such as, of course, ferrochelatase. Now, without functioning ferrochelatase, zinc is inserted into hemoglobin instead of iron. And lead also shortens the red blood cell's lifespan by causing membrane fragility and can accumulate in the proximal tubule of the kidney that leads to a decrease in erythropoietin levels. Now, in a moment, we will go over the peripheral blood smears and lead, but briefly, I want to mention that lead also causes degradation of RNA and RBCs, causing basophilic stipling on blood of the blood cells on a smear. That's an important uh, histological detail you need to remember. Certain neurological symptoms can also be seen, such as decreased cognitive function, aggression, depression. Okay? You might also see distal motor neuropathies and tremor. Now, as I mentioned, lead can accumulate in the kidneys, causing lead nephropathy. Labs that should be performed here include a CBC. That might show you microcytic anemia. Blood lead levels can be measured to assess for lead elevations. And if anemia is present, a blood smear should be performed because we want to assess for that specific histo finding I mentioned previously, which was what? basophilic stipling. So basophilic stipling, while important to look for, is not always present, and it can be seen in other pathologies. But their presence is consistent with lead poisoning, and if we are moving down the road toward lead poisoning and we see it, chances are that's what we're looking at. You also need to keep in mind that if we're dealing with lead nephropathy, creatinine levels can also be elevated. Now, diagnosis, uh, a diagnosis of lead poisoning would be confirmed by testing blood le lead levels. And an abnormal result is a lead level that is 5 micrograms per deciliter or higher. Now, if the lead level is between 5 and 30, it's recommended that patients reduce exposure to whatever lead source that, that has been identified that's causing their poisoning. If lead, le lead levels are above 30 micrograms per deciliter, they should completely avoid any exposure, which might unfortunately mean finding a different job if they're working in some sort of a profession that's causing the problem. So blood lead levels should be repeated in every patient to ensure that they're going down over time. If blood lead levels are above 40, you want to remove the patient from exposure. And if they're symptomatic, then we would give them chelation therapy with things like EDTA or DMSA. Now, if lead levels are above 80, 
then we do the same thing. We remove them from the exposure, but we definitely at this point need to give them chelation therapy. All right, let's do some content review questions. Here's your first question. I will put 20 seconds on the clock, figure this one out, and then come on back. Your correct answer here is B. Hopefully you got that one right. All right, next question. I'll put 20 seconds on the clock, but if you need a little more time, hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back. Correct answer here is A. And we have one more question. I'll put 20 seconds on the clock. If you need more time, hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back. The correct answer here is B, atrophic glossitis. All right, that is the end of this lecture. I will see you guys on the next one.